Okay. Thank you very much for uh, coming this afternoon to uh, um, hear Professor Eugenia Magnikova from Stanford University, who is our uh, speaker today. Um, Professor Magnikova is well known to the mathematical community of Montreal. As she, as she gave the uh, 2018 CRM uh, Nirenberg lectures in geometric analysis. Her research is on the area of uh, harmonic analysis, complex analysis, elliptic equations, and uh, generally geometric analysis. And her work has been award, uh, recognized by different awards, by several awards, by the Clay uh, Research Award, by uh, von Neumann Fellowship uh, in the state and the uh, Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton and by an invitation to speak at the 2018 the National Congress of Mathematicians in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, today, uh, as a topic, we do have uh, um, uh, only continuation for solutions of discrete and continuous uh, elliptic TVs. And, uh, Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm here, told my colleagues here, it's always a great pleasure to be back in Montreal. I will not so how many years ago I was here as a PhD student, it was a lot, and it's the best city that I know of. There were some com <laughs> complaints about that. <laughs> so I will, we'll talk about unique intonation for solutions of elliptic PDs, and it's colloquial talk, so I will be on very elementary grounds, or I, what I'm doing is quite elementary, so it's a good topic for a colloquial talk. Let me start with yeah, something happened, but I don't know what, what I did. Okay, so I will, there here is a plan of the talk. If I will be able to move the slides, I will talk about level theorem of harmonic functions that we all know. And then I'll talk about Schrodinger equation that we learned a lot during the hour. But well, once again, I'll do some elementary things there. And if I still have time, I'll do about Schrodinger evolutions, adding time to, to this equation. And I still don't know how to, yeah. Here's a list of core authors that will be mentioned during this talk. And you see, I have lots of very good courses on this, how you do mathematics. <clears throat> All right. So I will talk about discrete harmonic functions. I'm going to include the diagonal terms in the definition of my Laplace here. And as we know, every bounded harmonic function is a constant function. We were discussing during lunch today that there is a very nice short paper, how to do it for continuous harmonic functions, very good exercise for a student. And if you don't know how to do it for continuous ones, you have better chances to do it in a simple way for discrete ones. This is one of the examples that both statements are quite Simple, I would say the discrete one is more complicated than the continuous one. And it's better not to use your continuous intuition to prove the, the discrete one. The reason is for harmonic functions and the continuous world, we have very nice mean value theorem. And for discrete functions, if you try to write this mean value theorem, lots, lots of combinatorics involved and it's not as beautiful as it should be but there are other nice tools to, to prove that any bounded harmonic function is a constant. You can also prove that any positive harmonic function is a constant. So if it's bounded by from one side, it's enough to, to do that. And my first part of the talk will be about this statement. Uh, right. And um, we're going to talk about unique intonation and by unique intonation property, we mean unique intonation that is promoted here that if you have a harmonic function that vanishes on an open set that it's it's zero. By strong unique condition, what we mean with that is vanishing at one point to infinite order and zero. And the reason for that is that it's real analytic. It's real analytic, so we have this unique intonation. Wonderfully, this is not a property about being a real analytic, it's a property of elliptic equations. Ellipticities enough there and there are many works on this direction and I'll probably not go much into it today. But let us think about unique continuation for harmonic functions, for discrete harmonic functions. And unfortunately, naive version of unique continuation 
fails for discrete harmonic functions. Here is one example. So if you think about two lines of zeros, suppose you have a discrete harmonic function on Z2, and you need to know that your function is zero on the boundary of, of, of a half space with its normal derivative. Then we expect that it's zero everywhere, right? But it, and it's very easy to, to check. You take the zero, you check the harmonicity of the function at this zero here, and you get zero below. So it's zero on the next level, and so it's any function that is a zero Cauchy data is zero as it should be. But now let us look at a half plane that is one body on the diagonal. You know the values of the harmonic function, the next diagonal. So, but you can construct a function that is zero on the half plane and non, non zero on, on the other half plane. So it's, it's very counterintuitive if you think about continuous case. If you want to go into higher dimensions, the life is even less pleasant because now think about example here and add zeros on other diagonals. You'll have a function that is not harmonic, but it's a divisive equation, the Laplacian of a function equals constant times a function. It depends on the normalization of my Laplacian, it's four minus four times the function. And then you can extend it by adding one more variable in, in this way by making it harmonic. So there is a discrete harmonic function in Z3 on Z3 that is non zero on one hyperplane. That is a bit ridiculous, but there are these functions are, are, are there. On the other hand, if you are in the continuous world, construct harmonic functions that are bounded on most part of the the plane. One of the famous examples is you take a strip, you look at this integral, there is yeah, double exponential in this integral, but if you look carefully at my two sides of the of the strip, actually what I'm integrating there is decaying. And this integral gives you a bounded analytic function defined on the complement of the strip. By changing the contour of integration, you can extend it to your entire function. It will grow like double exponential in, in the strip, but it's bounded on the other part of the, of the plane. So in continuous world, there are these strange objects that were not bounded, but bounded in a big portion of the of the plane. And there are lots of results about discrete harmonic functions, including the Louisville theorem that dates to last century, the 20s of last century, the 30s of last century. And one of the interest was to prove results about continuous world using the discrete ones. For example, for discrete harmonic functions, it's very easy to show that the Dirichlet problem formulated in the right way has solution because it's a linear algebra problem. Maximal principle tells you that the only solution to homogeneous system is zero, then every Dirichlet problem has a solution. And it was a nice topic in, of approximating solutions of continuous problems by discrete ones. And this meta theorem should tell you that everything that happens with continuous ones should be happening to discrete ones because you can approximate every continuous function by discrete one. In particular, you can approximate this one by discrete harmonic function. So there should be some strange behavior with discrete continuous functions there. And the first result that I want to talk about is Louisville theorem for discrete harmonic functions. But now we assume that our function is bounded on a portion of the of Z2. So 
So we are claiming that there is a small epsilon such that your frank such that if your function is bounded on a large portion one minus epsilon portion of each sufficiently large square qn for me will be always as n by n square or 2n plus 1 by 2n plus 1 square doesn't matter too much so under the origin then the function is bounded and this example of a hyperplane tells you that the statement is false in this three so it's a very two-dimensional thing what we believe still is should be true in 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 this three that if it's bounded yeah if it's uh, right instead of the portion of where it's bounded you should say that if it's unbounded on only less than n square sides in on the cube of size n cube then it should be a constant but we don't know how to prove that for, for this reason. and for which other graphs in the graphs except for z2 you expect this to be uh, true or also it's definitely true for orthogonal lattice or triangular lattice mm -hmm. and i think any two periodic structure has this property but i don't think anyone try to prove it so it's not that the graph should be planar but it's that it should be two periodic there should be two um, there should be a finite set and two translations that will generate the whole graph I, I, I don't think anyone tried to write it write it down actually for for per, per, even periodic case so you don't can ask the question for, for the yeah graphs. yeah you can ask the question for bunch of graphs and as I said this question makes sense in for z3 or other graphs as well but you should be more careful it's not the portion there but it's another power of the number of points in your cube that you should use there the like on a tree or a graph with a few cycles that doesn't i think on tree doesn't have much much sense the harmonic functions of tree and trees are more simple yeah. so in this question um did you say you could get n to the two thirds of the point or n squared points i'm sorry no, I, 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 points yes i said that that i don't know how to do it with n squared or n to the power n two minus epsilon. I don't know how to do it. If it's unbounded on n to three halves, then the, there is a paper that tells you how to do it. I'll mention it it later. But yeah, there is this between n squared and then three three halves that we don't know. Don't see. And I think you should be surprised by this theorem because this is an example of something that is not true in continuous case and true in, in discrete case. And moreover, I will show you that it comes from two statements on the final scale. It's not about infinite Z2. You can see it on the finite scale. On the other hand, everything on the, at least on the finite scale that should happen in Continuous world happens in the discrete world because we have approximation. But there is another question. So, uh, so what makes Z2 special than among these events? This, there is too, too much structure. So exactly this one. If it, I'll mention probably some ideas of the proof, but one of them is you, you find a big set of zeros. You can just think about the um, toy problem first. In instead of saying that it's bound, it's think that it's zero in a large portion, and you want to show that it's zero everywhere. But if you find a large portion of zeros in two-dimensional case, you have not much freedom what happens next. So if it's not zero zeros next, there is constant of no zeros. On the next level, you will have a polynomial of degree one. Polynomial of degree two plus minus. And I'm able to, to bound the number of zeros in the region next to a large portion of zeros. In higher dimensions, there is less flexibility 
and you can still try to, to bound it and get some results, but they're much worse than this is it to, to so the two statements on the finite level are the following we are now thinking about the discrete harmonic function in what we think about this as qn tilted because this is a more natural domain for discrete harmonic function than usual cubes because if you know your, your function here there is only one way to extend it to to to, to this corner so it's easier to think about those. So suppose that I have a function in this cube Qn and is fixed. So the first theorem tells you that if function is bounded on the large portion, then the maximum on a half cube is not too large. It's exponentially bounded by an exponential error. And second theorem basically tells you the converse statement that if it's bounded now not only on on this one but many few k starting from a small one here if on, on each scale you know that it's bounded on one minus epsilon portion then it should grow fast one of those is discrete statement and another one is elliptic statement the second one it's what you expect if you have continuous intuition about elliptic physics. What I'm saying is that if my function is bounded in large portion, for example, it's allowed to grow only in angle here, then it should grow fast in this angle, at least exponentially. In, in continuous case, you can get better than exponential, you get n to some power here, depending on this epsilon. You cannot do it in good case, but in discrete case, and on the other hand, you can get the, the other bound. And this is a very discrete state. And the reason why this is those two theorems together don't give a contradiction in mathematics when you try to approximate continuous function that grows in angle by discrete ones is exactly in the details. The devil is always in the details. And the detail is here. I'm saying that I want my solution to be already of size two on a square of size square root of n on a much, much smaller scale. If you think about my function that is growing exponentially in the angle, when I want to approximate it really in a nice way by using discrete functions, I need a much smaller magnitude. And it's in it. That was like that statement. The second, second one, as I, as I said, it's what you would expect. And the, the second one holds in any dimension, it's got two dimensional result. And it's what your usual elliptic estimate should uh, imply. And the, the other one uses this structure of the discrete harmonic functions dimension so one of the ideas for theorem b that is elliptic one is that you have unique continuation in this for the discrete harmonic functions and by this quantitative unique continuation i mean a statement like that suppose that i have a function that is bounded on a large cube bounded by some constant m and bounded by one on a smaller cube here or big portion of the smaller cube. Then we claim that in the intermediate cube, it's bounded by some power of m that is less than one. And it's, if you wish, it's the Mars three circle theorems or three ball theorems for solutions of elliptic PDs. You have estimate on a small scale on a big scale you have estimate in between and for this proof we actually needed the version where the second estimate is not on the whole cube of size one fourth but on a part of it so some some positive measure if you wish you you know that your function is small on some positive measure with fixed measure there then you have this unique continuation 
And for this one, on continuous world, we know how to do it from elliptic estimates, or elliptic techniques. On the discrete world, for the proof of this that I know, we use renal elasticity. We write a boson kernel, we use it, this boson kernel is real analytic, and we use some tools that shouldn't be there. There should be some elliptic discrete tools in, instead of this one. And as far as I understand, there is some Carleman estimates for discrete case that could be useful here, but I don't think there is a proof that is written down. Let me go. And going to the lecture that most of you attended our before, the reason why we started to think about unique intonation for discrete harmonic functions, so one of the reasons is because I was fortunate to listen to a talk of Carlos Koenig exactly 10 years ago, where he complained that for Anderson localization, you need discrete unique intonation on the discrete models, and it's very different from the continuous ones. And we didn't get far into this direction, but there are other people who did, and I will tell you a couple of references about this. So this is the random Schrodinger on discrete lattice, ZD, with potential that takes value 0, 1, or you can think plus minus 1, but it's not very important, depends on the, your energy level. And by optimization, we mean that the eigenfunction should, that grows at most polynomially actually decays exponentially. It's now in fact in dimension one, and there are interesting problems related to Anderson localization in dimension, starting from two, at least for, for this Bernoulli potential. And there is a nice result by Link and Smart saying that in dimension two, for if you are close to the edge of the spectrum, you have Anderson localization almost surely. And I reformulated our discrete continuation, our result on the Louisville theorem, or part of it that was theorem A in this form. This is a deterministic statement that if you have a harmonic function, discrete harmonic function, you want to count how many times on the cube it's larger than this exponential factor times the, the maximum and a half cube, what you get is estimate like that. And in random case, the statement is that actually implies uh, Anderson localization is that if instead you look at the event that this set has cardinality larger than n to three halves, roughly speaking, and then this event is has large, large probability. And this L should be N there. And the difference is we're working with harmonic function, functions with a very rigid structure. As soon as you add potential there, there is no such rigid structure there, and the method should be different. But it turns out that if you instead you use random potentials, you are able to, to show that the this this event has large probability and even more surprisingly the result that appeared last year is you can do the same in dimension three once again near the edge of the spectrum there is almost sure Anderson localization and now that there is a big difference between dimension two and three and dimension three is easier in this particular case dimension three is easier because there is a deterministic statement as it was mentioned, you don't need to go all the way here to n squared. Three halves is enough. And anything larger than one would be enough in dimension two. Anything starting from three halves would be enough in dimension three. And they show that there is a p larger than three halves. So that this statement happens deterministically. There is this 
nice structure and they are able to find lots of places where the structure is, is like that and we find pieces where the, the, the estimate holds but it's a very nice and technical sink but once again the difference is here we are talking about any solution to shrugging your with mystically without randomness it was there I'll go now to the statement where the question comes from and it's the connection of Anderson localization with this unique intonation property that is in Burgund clinic paper in 2003 probably and we're talking about solutions of the your equation with potential and we're asking how fast those solutions may decay at infinity in discrete world this naive question how fast they may decay is quite simple they may decay exponentially there are examples where they decay exponentially and there is nothing more that you can say about this this is a sim quite simple estimate that if you take a um, spherical shell around zero and you normalize your function by say one at, at one potential is bounded then you are not less than exponential in r on this on this spherical show and there are solutions like that but what is needed actually for was what was needed for continuous Anderson localization was a local statement what can you say locally I have a solution to this Shorting your equation, I normalize my solution so that this is say one and it's the maximum two. So it's, it's think about it's decaying with this bounded, and you want to know what happens to your solution. In the discrete world, there is no way you can know what happens here. There are solutions like that with zeros on, on squares. And uh, again, in Kenning, we're able to prove estimate for the continuous case. One of the questions that was not settled is actually what is the, the best estimate? And it goes back to old conjecture by Landis, who said that if you have a solution of the Schrodinger equation with bounded potential, then the solution should not decay faster than exponential. There is a solution that decays exponentially. You can just think about this function e2 minus absolute value of x, probably do small changes that fit near the order to have a smooth function and check that Laplacian is bounded by constant times this function. So it's solution of this Schrodinger equation with bounded potential. But question is, can you construct a function that decays faster than that with the same property? There is a remark that for pot solutions, definitely there is no way by Harnick inequality. Have to... There is a very simple argument showing that it cannot decay faster than minus x squared if you know elementary Kerleman inequality. But the truth is that the right exponent is x to four thirds. And it's a result of Mishko from 1992, where for example, where a solution decays like that, if it's complex valued. Solution is about to be complex valued, your potential is complex valued, then the decay is like that. And it's the local version of this result by Mishkov that Burgen and Kenick were using for Anderson localization or for the continuous situation, and they after their work, there was a renewed interest in, in, in this Landis conjecture. Right. So this is the local version saying that on, on each ball like that, you have a local estimate that supremes at least this E2 R into four thirds, but you, you lose a local factor. You want to use one over R factor. And uh, it's it, it, Inequality, inequality and, uh, and uh, very, 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 very
a way of waiting the signal point that comes up potentially as a real potential source. And uh, I wanted to try to try and work with Dr. Lubunov and Nikolai Nidirashvili and Fidim. And it tells you that on dimension two, Blundis conjecture holds if you allow an epsilon there. So if you have a solution that is bounded by this function e to minus constant sort of x log square root of log x, then it's zero. And you will ask why there is a square root of log x there. What does it mean? Should it be there? And the most surprising thing is it should be there. And this part that is hopefully will be written someday. It tells you that if there is a solution like that. So the, the, this constant is important. This constant is where the, the place, the, the third of walk is, is the right, is the right thing. That is probably one of the most surprising things in this story because yeah, we, we believed in the Mondes conjecture, but that it's not about this constant in front of X, but there is an extra term here. It was, was surprising. Uh, the question is what happens in higher dimensions and you still have a conjecture that in higher dimensions things like that should happen at least i don't know about square root of log but with that one plus epsilon and we have no idea how to to do it um, there is a local version and the local version once again you you lose one extra log here it's not square root of log now it's log to three halves if you want to to bound what happens on scale one on a ball of distance r to, 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 to the watch. And the proof is very two dimensional in several places. And one of those places is where we use quasi conformal map to, 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 to do the one of the reductions. But they can probably say two, two words about the proof before I show you the next slide. The first idea of the proof is comes from uh, Nikolai Nidershvili, who is trying to apply it for estimates of the nodal sets of eigenfunctions in dimension two. I don't know how to use his trick for, for that, but it was very useful or well, useful here. And the trick is the following, you start with this equation and you don't like potentials. So what you're trying to do is to look at your equation in R2, and you do surgery to your plane, you actually do two things. First of all, we want to use it we are in a real world. How to use it here in a real world, you think that your function is positive or negative or zero. So you have a where function is zero, I don't know how it looks like, but it looks somehow. And then you take one connected component of this set and add lots of lots of circles to this that are completely inside. Basically, what you're trying to do, you want to make the first eigenvalue of this new domain large enough. And then you find another solution to your equation in each domain. You solve the same. This is one of the nodal domains with holes. And then you divide one solution by another one. And at the end, what you get is function B. So what you get this function F is very close to one. If you do it carefully, you'll see that your function F is very close to one when you do that by solving the right problem in a domain with very large first Dirichlet eigenvalue. And it turns out that this Function solves equation, I, I believe, like this one. It now has diver, divergence form elliptic equation with no lower terms. But not on the whole R2, but in it solves in each domain, but then you can actually go across the domains where your function was zero. So it solves it in R2 minus union of some balls. And there is one more nice thing about this function is not only solves this equation if you look at the boundary of each ball 
we place our, this holes ourselves in a way that my solution is positive or negative around each hole. So these holes are also nice in the sense that I may assume that V is positive or V is negative on each ball like that. And after that, you have a divergence form equation in dimension two, you use quasi conformal maps to map it into harmonic functions, and you get the following toy problem that you should ask your students in complex analysis to solve. Because it's very elementary, especially if you have Fizer and Zarif who <laughs> can do it for you. But yeah, if you see, look at the proof, it's, it's really elementary. and First year graded students taking complex analysis should be able to, to do it after you after you, you, you see this maximal principle basically for gradients of harmonic functions that are holomorphic functions that are there. It tells you that if you have a harmonic function on the plane with holes, with this additional condition that around each hole the function is either positive or negative, then this function may k but not faster than exponential. No lower risk here, fortunately. So it's it's very, very nice statement. And statement like that is actually true in, in higher dimensions, except with some logarithms we don't have complex analysis, but we do have Carleman estimates. And this toy problem is not where the difficulty is going to to higher dimensions. We can do do it with some loss of folks in higher dimensions as, as well. That this is what is. What is written here, but this is an. But for this log, we're not sure that it should be there. It's a different square root of, of log, not not the same. All right. So this is uh, the ideas of the second result that I wanted to to show, and it's also connected to this question of. Unique intonation that was brought by Morgan and Koenig in connection to Anderson localization. Right. Um, I want to mention one more topic, and it's what will happen when you do um, shorting your evolutions, so you add time. And I will start with something that if you were sleeping, you can pay attention to the next five minutes because I think this is a very nice thing. We all know hard uncertainty principle or we'll teach our students or should teach our students hard uncertainty principle that says that if you have a function in Fourier transform that decay faster than Gaussians, then the function is zero. And if you Think about the proof that you show your students you use fragment and love series. But actually, if you go to the original work of Hardy, there are two proofs. And the second one is more elementary from, I think, point of view of most of your students. It's not clear where it comes from, but it's quite elementary. There is no fragment and love theorem. So if you're afraid of complex analysis. Mm -hmm. I think it's a problem with the the own question. Can you do it? Oh, yeah. Well, then what's what's happening? Do they try to yes. disconnect it for a moment? Oh, yes. It's my 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 there is no co less complex analysis in this in the second proof, and I will show you not what Hardy did, but what you can do to prove Hardy's uncertainty with not what, a lot of complex analysis. You should think about trying your evolution, and it's not difficult to show that. Hardy's uncertainty is equivalent to this statement. 
It was noticed by Scoriaza, Kenig, Ponce, and Vega, and by Sagun Chanilo that just doing the Fourier transform of your solution, that if you have a solution that decays at two different times, like that, say time zero and one, then it, it decays fast enough than the solution is zero. In your evolution, this pressure in your evolution, and it is fast enough then up and the solution should be zero. Just to get like that. The first the second part is about about the quality to portion in this boundary. boundary case. You can also do it quite easy, but but let me concentrate on, on, on this one if it's actually below the right out. What I want to do is to think about solution to this equation, but instead of Writing Schrodinger, I will write when Z is real, I have heat equation. When Z is imaginary, I have Schrodinger. But I can do it with, with a parameter here. Suppose that I have an equation that is U0 that decays fast enough. And you're trying to use your heat kernel think about actual time as being complex so you're trying to convolve your solution with the heat kernel and see when it makes sense heat equation makes sense always schrodinger makes sense because my solution is very nice the backwards heat doesn't make sense but if you do it carefully you will see that the only complex times if you wish when you're not allowed to Solve this equation using the convolution with a Cauchy kernel, with a um, heat kernel, is exactly a circle on the complex plane here. If you also know that your solution decays when time is i, it's what Schrodinger equation tells you, then there is another circle here. They touch exactly when these exponentials, a, alpha, and beta, or like that. If they, if they are larger, they don't touch at all. So you have an extension of your initial function as function of z into the whole complex plane. It's bounded. Then the theorem that we love tells you that it's it's a constant. And it's that there was not certain, no certain equation in what Hardy wrote in his second proof. But if you look at the formulas they're very close to what you'll get if you use this continuation two times and this is a proof of the sorry on the last line uh, probably time is uh, forgotten time on the right hand side there's no time on slide on slide on slides there's no time yes. in the right hand side was t t yes, yes there is t in the formula in the solution yes there is solution. t it's it's the this small t should be zero, so your initial value is like that, and then you can convolve it and find out what solution is. Yeah, but it tells no. you that the initial condition is, is like that. Yeah. It doesn't depend on t. Where is t? This t here should be zero, so your initial condition, if you function the case like that, then the initial conditions is a Gaussian. But the right hand side, where is <laughs> okay. In the right hand side, I say, what is T in the right hand side? Yes. There is no T in right the right hand side. side. In the left hand side, there is no T but zero. Ah, zero, okay. Mm -hmm. T is zero, yeah. Ah, uh -huh. okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. And there is a nice series of papers by Skorazek, Kenik, Ponce, and Vega, who show that actually there is a real proof to Hardy inequality and much more, you have a similar precise statement for evolutions with bounded potentials. The potentials are more restrictive than, than bounded. They have a real valued independent part, and then they have time dependent part that should decay fast enough. 
or your whole potential should have some decay properties. And that is a very nice machinery showing that you, you have this uniqueness for solutions of Schrodinger evolutions when the potential is bounded. And what we are, are trying to do, what we're trying to do is still trying to do is to get this for discrete evolutions. And the original result was independently obtained in our joint paper with Philippe Jamar and Yuri Rubarsky and Caleb Perfect, and also by Aaron Gary Fernandez Bertalin already eight years ago, saying it, that if you have yeah, pre evolution, then the heat kernel is not Gaussian function anymore. It's, um, Bessel function, so if you have decay faster than Bessel function should be zero, as it's not difficult, but you can do it the same for bounded potentials. With one thing, we're not able to put this gamma to the right bound. We expect that the bound should be like here. We're able to prove that for some gamma, if it decays fast enough, then the solution is zero. And then we were able to take this gamma equal to one, but have exponential or, or this, this, the second term here, but still we're not there to start the iterations that will allow us to move to use the machinery of Escureza, Tenic, Ponce, and Vega and get the, the right estimate for from it. So we know that for large enough, we will get uniqueness. We know what should be the right move if we look at the free case and we're trying to go between those and get the result there. It turns, it looks like for discrete case, it's the boundaries of the potential that plays a role. We don't see how you can use any more restrictive class of potentials, it should work for, for any bounded potential, but for the moment there is some gap between what we want and what we can prove for, for this one. So thank you very much for, for your attention. I'll stop now. Thank you very much for this very nice talk. And uh, we have questions about the questions. Okay, I have one more question. Uh, when you choose another bound for B in T, for example, in this last theorem, how do all the constants move, for example, mu? Uh, for example, if you say B, infinity is yeah. smaller than yeah. one force. It doesn't depend on, on, on our so mu, doesn't, that doesn't depend on the, on the size of B. So it's only V bound? Yes, only V bound. Okay. Only v -bound. But what, what yeah. about in both? It's, it, it's a good question. What, what should you do? Because, I mean, what makes sense? What more normalization? You understand that, that when V is small, it's a very different operator and V is large. But we don't see it in, in our methods. But yes, it, it, you know, it, the question for you is there is no more important. Yeah, there is no rescaling here. And the question which part of the operator is more important. So, but we don't see it when in, in our methods there. Yeah, but it's an interesting question. What? Can you shed some light in the square of the floor? No. Huh? No. No, I mean it's 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 a very technical for the moment. It's a very technical and uh, argument that gives you an example of very technical construction. Right. And hopefully, it's a problem, but there was no yeah. Problem. So it somewhere where you were... yeah. In, in the in the proof, you can in the proof it it, it appears when you do quasi conformal math. Mm -hmm. It's what you yeah. you get. But the the very surprising thing that that it's yeah. it's for for reasons there, yeah. And this is. If someone would construct a simple example, we would be very, very happy. <laughs> if, because there is an example, it's very technical, no one wants to yeah, take care of it. But if, if it would be a simple example, it would be very useful. Can you ask you the comment that there are not um, many techniques that come from discrete PTEs? Can you comment a little bit on this? Like, uh, I don't know. I mean, the, there is a thing that where people do discrete Kerleman estimates, and they think they could be useful in things like like that, and to, uh, in particular, 
for, for, for example, for what I was showing originally. And for me, the, the question is also what, what is the right elliptic discretization? What, what equations do we want to describe and, and, and how? I, I'm sure, for example, that this theorem is about elliptic equations, not real analytic things. But what what we're trying to, to get there and what, what is the right? Thank you. Any other questions? No, yes. Right, then, then you get one pole here, but your function is uh, bounded and you, you can you can compute what what happens. That. We were we wrote uh, with with Anne Garo, we wrote a survey about this and we included the proof of this of this there. You can do it carefully, but a little bit more complex analysis than just Louisville serum, but it still gives you the, the full Harding. But, but then we went back to the original paper of Hardy and realized that he was doing very similar things originally, but somehow everyone prefers fragment linear of serum. That's why I like a lot, but I think most students don't. If not, let's thank the speaker again. And